I think a, another example I, I didn't flag and one that would be of uh, particular interest to consumers is kind of just this discussion about um, endangered species. Mm-hmm. Um, very important to um, do whatever we can to keep every species that God made on this planet. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, we hear that side of the story so much. And, and um, what happens to our growers is the Endangered Species Act keeps them from tapping in on certain water resources, mm-hmm. uh, particular in the Delta region. And um, I think some, it, it's very difficult to try to get out in front of the other side of the story, which is, oh, you you know, if you're going to do that, then you're going to kill X, Y, and Z. And then you want to also tell the consumer, well, if we don't use that water, especially during a drought year, then we can't continue producing the strawberries that you get at your local farmer's market. Mm-hmm. We can't continue producing the almonds, um, or, you know, the sweet potatoes, whatever it is. Welcome to Talk Ag to Me, the podcast dedicated to improving ag literacy around the globe. I'm your host, Brennan Black, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking all about agriculture in terms of regulation, legislature, and all that other fun stuff. And uh, here to help me with this episode, I have a special guest by the name of Sarah Nagy Reed here to talk about it because she is an expert in the field. And so I'm going to let her give her own little introduction before we jump into this conversation here. Sarah? Thanks, Brendan. So my name is Sarah Nagy Reed. Um... I have been working in the agricultural policy space for about six to seven years now. Um, in my current capacity, I am the associate director for federal policy at the California Farm Bureau Federation. I oversee a number of different issues um, that fall anything between immigration, uh, you know, for our workforce, uh, COVID relief packages. Um, and biotechnology along with uh, farm bill programs, other pieces of legislation that are very important to farmers that are dealt with at the federal level. Hmm. Uh, in my uh, previous life, I used to work in Washington, D.C. I was a political appointee for the Obama administration, and I worked at the Department of Agriculture where I handled legislative affairs and um, policy issues related to marketing regulatory programs. So anything from organic to biotech to uh, pests and diseases, um, you name it, that fell under that umbrella. And before that, I worked for a member of Congress. So I have been in the space for a little while, um, both uh, policy and politics. And I'm so excited to be here today to bring some perspective on what all is happening in the space, um, mainly now with COVID going on, but even prior to that. Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely a conversation piece that isn't had enough. You know, a lot of people don't don't tend to think about um, agricultural uh, legislature when they think of all the things that go on in D.C. and, and in, our, in our state and federal government. And so it's definitely something that is, you know, I've been advocating for it a lot in, in my podcast, you know, getting out there and educating yourself on what's going on in, in the world of legislature in terms of how your food is grown, because people tend to not realize how much their vote impacts the way that their food is grown and the prices of their food and everything in between. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have you on, on today so we can talk, talk a little bit about some of those some of those types of subjects. Yeah, I'm very excited to be on. And to that point, Brendan, it's so important for our farmers and for consumers who have an interest and follow, you know, food policy and agriculture policy to have a seat at the table. Because if we don't, then others will be calling the shots for us mm-hmm. when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to additional regulations on businesses, uh, when it comes to technology and across the board. So it's, it's very important now more than ever before that we have a seat at the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I could, couldn't agree more. So before we jump into the uh, more, I guess, conversational interview, um, would you mind kind of just explaining, you know, what, what your background in agriculture is, kind of how you got into this field, why, you know, why you decided to go into ag law and, and all that kind of stuff, just kind of give, give my, my audience a little bit of context as to where you come from? Absolutely, sure. So I actually was born and raised in Oakland, California, a very, mm. very urban area <laughs> Yeah, uh, you're probably familiar with. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I, I've always had agriculture in my bloodline. Um, my parents actually came to the United States as religious refugees in the 80s. Mm. Um, they own, um, they're fourth generation um, row crop growers in Romania. Um, so they own uh, acres and acres of land. Uh, my mom also had dairy cows and also um, for a certain amount of acres for tomato production. Unfortunately, due to communism um, and Ceausescu's rule uh, over the country, um, the land was taken away from them, mm. and they were being persecuted for their beliefs. So they decided to um, to take advantage of uh, the religious refugee visas that were available under uh, Jimmy Carter's administration and moved to the United States. Um, so growing up, even in an urban setting, I was always reminded about um, what farming meant, um, why it was important, um, and how difficult the work is. Um, farmers are resilient leaders. My parents were too. Unfortunately, they didn't come here with a lot of money and they couldn't afford buying any, lot, uh, any land, but um, they did instill that within you know me and my siblings growing up that it is so important um, to be invested in agriculture and to view our growers as public servants because that's really what they are. Mm. Um, so with that, like I said, I, I grew up in an urban setting. I ended up going to the University of Hawaii. Um, <laughs> and while I was there, I was also in an agriculture program. So I started um, sort of minoring in uh, tropical ag studies. And um, after two years of being there, I, I kind of had um, island fever. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided to uh, transition uh, and transfer to the University of San Francisco. And again, not too many ag programs available there, so that's where I really pivoted to bid on uh, policy mm. and um, politics, and I ended up getting a bachelor's in political studies. Um, and, that, you know, just the ag policy bug kept, um, kept following me and biting me, and I decided to... Um, take my first position with Del Monte Food, which used to be headquartered in San Francisco, Can Food Company. Um, and I worked there as a government relations assistant. Um, I worked with their federal lobbyists, and um, that's when the Farm Bill negotiations were going on. Um, and just a little about, a bit of background, um, Farm Bill is, uh, it takes place every four years, and it's a, a huge package that basically funds and creates new programs at the Department of Agriculture that growers are able to apply to. Uh, it ranges from anything from crop insurance to marketing trade promotion programs. So it's very important to the ag community and to the folks in the policy space um, to be involved in that. Hmm. Uh, and and from there, it just kind of took off. I, I couldn't let it go. It became um, more uh, invested in other um, issues that pertain to agriculture, like um, immigration reform, which is very, very important, mm. uh, especially in California and especially crop-producing states, where we rely on a, a very large migrant workforce, and then also got more invested in um, trade policy as well. So, you know, looking at the bilateral agreements that are going on right now that have gone in the past, um, definitely have focused on that space as well. Um, so that's kind of a, a little bit of my background, how I... Uh, uh, really involved in the agriculture policy space, and um, what has uh, brought me here to where I currently serve at um, California Farm Bureau as Associate Director for Federal Policy. Awesome! Yeah, it definitely sounds like you've had, you know, quite the experience in in this field. It's it's, it's it, you, you don't really hear a whole lot of stories of people going to uh, college in Hawaii and San Francisco and you know coming out into ag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's not many of us, um, and and I think you know also just urban agriculture has always been an interest of mine, mm -hmm. and nutrition policy as well, which um, I'm able to work on those issues at Farm Bureau as well um, in my current role. But that definitely comes with the fact that I grew up in an urban setting, and I thought that there were individuals who were invested in. Um, uh, vertical operations and doors and all sorts of other rooftop gardens. And, you know, I, I don't think there's one size fits all when it comes to agriculture and farming practices. And it's really cool to see that that area has definitely expanded in urban settings. So um, mm. that definitely comes with the fact that I grew up in a urban. 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. And that's definitely a really interesting point. And before we kind of move on to a lot more of the, the conversation we were talking about before with, with, you know, how COVID has impacted everything, I kind of wanted to yeah. pivot off of a point you just mentioned. So in terms of urban agriculture, is there much in, in terms in, in the like the legislative uh, side of things that, that's impacting or, or being impacted by urban agriculture? Because we're starting to see more of a more of a push towards that sort of thing as we're losing um, rural land. So is is there a legislative uh, component to urban agriculture right now or is it because it, because it's so new we haven't gotten that far yet? That's a great question, actually. So going back to the farm bill, in um, the last round of negotiations that took place uh, in, in the most recent farm bill, 2018, uh, we were able for the first time ever to um, put a place provisions in the bill that would create an urban agriculture office of the Department of Agriculture. That has mm. never happened. So first time ever. Um, it's being implemented right now. They're stacking it up. And it's basically going to be a one-stop shop for those individuals who don't um, d- don't produce in more rural parts of our state and our nation, hmm. who might be in the suburbs or in an urban setting. And I think sometimes when we talk about urban agriculture, we define it as, oh, community garden. And sure, it can be that too, but hmm. it's way more than that. I mean, if you think about these companies, like Plenty is a perfect example about the vertically integrated indoor operations that are popping up throughout the nation. Those are considered urban agriculture, mm. and they are very impressive. I mean, they can produce tons and tons of produce, anything from leafy greens to strawberries. Um, so urban agriculture is ex- extremely important. It's a part of the conversation now. It's not rural versus urban anymore. We're all in this together. So. Um, it was very exciting that the Farm Bill included um, provisions to create that office at the Department of Agriculture to acknowledge that these are producers, they are part of the agriculture sphere, um, and they may need assistance too. So with that said, there are some grants available now at the Department of Agriculture, um, and there's also technical assistance and advisory committees to talk about um, what are the next steps. Um, what does irrigation look like in an urban setting? Um, what is organic standard for this type of production? Uh, so it's very exciting. Uh, it all comes together the last two years. Um, but it's just, you know, also the discussion um, that these are, like I said, producers in the ur- uh, urban space that are considered agriculture. Um, and there's no difference between uh, the acreage they have versus the acreage in rural parts of America. Wow. <laughs> no, that's awesome. They they're they're getting their own department in the USDA and everything. I mean, that that's like I've been doing a lot of research lately on urban agriculture because I've been getting a lot of questions about it through the podcast because you know, with everything going on, people are a lot more curious about, you know, what are we going to do when we run out of land? Are there ways we can adapt urban land into agricultural land? So I've been doing mm-hmm. my research and I actually hadn't come across the, you know, the proposal to, to produce the branch in the USDA for urban agriculture. But I think that's, that's, you know, that's awesome. Like, we definitely need that. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, uh, uh, I, and I know that there's not a whole lot of documentation on it, but there's the, the Pegasus project. They tried it in Chicago. Um, it's, it's kind of like a small, I, I can't remember what it, it's like maybe a hundred acre operation that was supposed to be like a community. It's almost like a community garden, but it's supposed to be larger and it's supposed to be like more productive than a community garden. It was supposed to teach like inner, inner city school kids about agriculture or something like that. And it was kind of, it, wow. it, it was an earlier project that I'm not sure if it actually ever took off, but uh, like stuff like that was kind of what, what I pictured as urban agriculture but yeah no you're absolutely right i mean vertical farming rooftop gardens you know like any any new innovative form of of agriculture that we haven't tried in the rural areas is is definitely on the table for for viable um, agricultural production i think it should be taken as seriously as what we do out in the fields absolutely and if you think about it it's not like there's a huge surplus of new and beginning farmers out there and it's unfortunate but it's so difficult to farm these days, mm-hmm. you know, related to regulations, related to just the uncertainty of what Mother Nature is going to bring us <laughs> next, you know, these um, forest fires that are going on. There's just a number of different issues. But when you're talking about a um, you know, beginning farmer, someone who wants to um, start their own operation, mm-hmm. um, start production in agriculture, 
sometimes um, I think it's easier for them to become invested and involved in an urban act space because you're not working with as much acreage. Um, and there are some wonderful organizations out there. Uh, Center for Land-Based Learning is one in particular that I'll call out. They're based here in Sacramento, where, where I currently reside. And um, they do kind of these pilot um, farming operations for these new and beginning farmers. And they're able to manage that land, produce on it. Um, and it's about five to ten acres. And it's, mm. it's mainly like in an urban setting or outside of an urban setting. Um, and that kind of launches them into now, you know, go invest in what acreage you want to buy. Just mm. so you know how to start and manage. Because if you didn't grow up on a farm, that's just overwhelming to go, you know, to Central Valley or to the Midwest and have uh, a five thousand acre plot of land <laughs> producing on where do you even start mm. so it's just really neat that a lot of these new beginning farmers have an opportunity through programs like that and also just in a more smaller setting um that is usually based in urban and suburban area yeah no that's awesome that's that's you know, I, I think it's really interesting to see the the evolution of you know technology and practices and you know as much as the as, as a traditionalist in in a lot of us you know hates to see us you know starting to move towards you know other methods of agriculture than what we had tradition traditionally out in the fields i mean at the end of the day like you said you know we're all on the same team here we're trying to make sure we have food for everybody and we can't really get picky with how we're going to get that food and if it's going to work we're going to do it kind of thing and so I think that's that's really really cool that they're making such you know such strides towards towards producing that as a viable source of, of food production. So I think um, absolutely, yeah, no, definitely. So I think that moving a little bit away from from the the urban ag topic, I just really wanted to get into that because urban agriculture is something that is talked about a lot, and it's there's you know there's a lot of things thrown around, but not a lot of of you know hard evidence on on what's actually going on in in the urban ag world. So I really wanted to get the perspective of somebody who knows on you know on here to talk about it a little bit. Um, but yeah, moving on. Yeah, it's just it's exciting. It's, it, I mean, it's also about you know new forms of technology and mechanization mm-hmm. in the ag space, and and that gives um, individuals the ability to do these sort of vertical indoor operations, but. Um, yeah, it, it's been a debate, uh, to be full transparency in the ag community itself about, well, there's rural versus urban, um, sort of situation, but I think that folks are starting to move away from that and understand that urban producers aren't trying to pull resources from rural and vice versa. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, they're just on different tracks. So, um, it's exciting to see that everyone's kind of coming together and, you know, this like kumbaya fashion <laughs> thing where all is it together, so. Yeah, definitely. I think that, I mean, you're seeing that with a lot of different industries right now, even like, you know, with, with the organic versus conventional industries, with mm-hmm. uh, cattle growers versus crop growers, with uh, even dairy versus beef. I mean, like with a lot of these industries, there were such rivalries for such a long time and some of them still exist, but we're starting to get to a point now where, you know, everyone's in trouble. So we're kind of just banding together and do what we can to keep each other alive. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. So that kind of transitions into another uh, question that I had for you, and you know we're we're gonna get to your uh, your uh, you you were pretty excited to talk about everything going on with with the COVID situation, so we're gonna get to that here in just a second. Yeah. Um, but before we get there, I did want to pick your brain a little bit because you've like you mentioned you've worked in in California agricultural legislature and you've worked in D.C. and you've worked on the federal level and you know you you've seen how agriculture works in different states, so. Would you mind kind of commenting on the difference in policy or regulation between California agriculture and other states and even on the federal level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, California is um, by far the most diverse state when it comes to agriculture. Mm. Well, when it comes to a lot of, but you know, <laughs> agriculture and what we produce here, I think we can produce a response to different commodities, which we do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that sets us up um, in an interesting spot when it comes to regulations, when it comes to um, bills that are being proposed to deal with some of our biggest issues. Um, we're not a one-size-fits-all here. Sometimes I think that our state regulatory bodies believe us, <laughs> um, and sometimes I believe the federal um, agencies do as well. Hmm. Um, but here, that, that's not the way it works. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, discounting anything that the Midwest does, but easier for them to um, 
band together and um, try to make a, a new regulation being implemented work because they're mainly road costs or mm-hmm. they're mainly dairy. Um, they're not as diverse as California. So um, I, I would start with that. Uh, I would say additionally, when you look at our state, we produce the most specialty crops. Um, and with that comes a lot of issues. Um, one of them is the largest and um, most costly one being um, how we are regulated in terms of our workforce. Um, I can't necessarily speak too much to state uh, regulatory agencies like Palo Osha, but uh, I oversee federal issues and not really state. But to that point, um, we are heavily regulated in that space. And, and that's perfectly fine. I think to, you know, our, our priority mm-hmm. in working in agriculture is our workforce, mm-hmm. ensuring their safety, um, you know, that we have the, the right protocols and measures in place, especially with COVID now, to um, make sure that we have some sort of staggered um, scheduling, some sort of social distancing, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, PPE resources, all of that. But at the same time, sometimes um, it can get very costly, and I don't think that federal government or state agencies realize that and it makes it very 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 difficult to continue um producing Mm. um you know you're not going to put that cost on the consumer um you are just going to take it upon yourself uh so that is one area that i would say california um is, is very unique in i know that some other you know states Michigan, Florida, other large fresh crop producing states do deal with regulations too, but in California we deal with um, federal regulations and then we deal with our state. So um, both those, you know, just, just uh, it can get very costly. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I would say, um, you know, another area that we we're really worried about, and uh, thanks to this administration, it was rolled back. This regulation was the waters of the U.S. I'm sure you are familiar with that. Mm-hmm. It was basically a regulation that would, um, uh, at the federal level, that regulated every single body of water you had on your property. It could have been a pond, mm-hmm. and it was regulated. Make things very difficult when um, you know someone comes around and does an audit or enforcement and. You're just constantly being audited. You're constantly having folks on your property check for X, Y, and Z related to water, related to pesticide usage, related to, you know, the workforce. And at some point, it just gets really draining. And sometimes folks just say, enough is enough, and I think I'm just going to shut down my business because you can't be overregulated. If you want to continue producing food and not having it imported from other countries that don't regulate period or if they do it's um very lax mm-hmm. um i think that our lawmakers really need to take a step back and realize that there has to be a balance um that we can't too extreme or let's do some sort of phase and approaches like the waters of the u.s goal mm-hmm. or um you know climate and uh, climate change and sustainability efforts and regulations that will probably be rolling out here in the very near future so i think that's what makes us very unique here our type of production, how much um, we produce, and, and the diverse um, operations that we have. And, um, uh, yeah, that can get a little costly. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's for sure. I've I definitely heard uh, the uh, the uh, amount of, of cost that, that is accumulated with that kind of stuff from some of the farmers in my area. Um, so, yeah, no, that's definitely – I wanted you to touch on that just because I, I get a lot of questions because, I mean, I talk to people all the time that don't even realize how agriculturally productive California is. And when I mention how, how productive we are, then they start to have questions about how, you know, why you know why California is so undesirable for, for farmers to live in. And I have to explain to them, you know, the regulation situation over here and, you know, how how strict it can be and, and how different it is in other states. And we have the whole conversation about that kind of thing, which is usually a surprise to them. So I wanted to get kind of clarification on, you know, making sure that I'm not spreading any false information or anything. <laughs> No, I appreciate you bringing it up. I think a, another example I, I didn't flag and one that would be of uh, particular interest to consumers is kind of just this discussion about um, endangered species. Mm-hmm. Um, 
very important to um, do whatever we can to keep every species that God made on this planet. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, we hear that side of the story so much. And, and um, what happens to our growers is the Endangered Species Act keeps them from tapping in on certain water resources, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in the Delta region. And um, I think some, it's, it's very difficult to try to get out in front of the other side of the story, which is, oh, you you know, if you're going to do that, then you're going to kill X, Y, and Z. And then you want to also tell the consumer, well, if we don't use that water, especially during the drought year, then we can't continue producing the strawberries that you get at your local farmer's market. Mm-hmm. We can't continue producing the almonds, um, you know, the sweet potatoes, whatever it is. And um, it, again, it goes back to the conversation of over-regulating. It's about looking at that list of endangered species and doing, you know, an analysis. Okay, which of these are actually still on the list and which has made a comeback due to the restrictions that are in place? Mm-hmm. And, you know, trying to delist some of these so that we can have access to those water resources and continue feeding the state and also America. Mm-hmm. Um but similarly, of course, and, you know, being very conscious of that as well. And I only flag that because, like I said, I think it's very easy for certain groups to get out and to kind of have that sympathetic story about these um, species or the sympathetic story about whatever the issue is. And, and it's not always very fair to the agriculture community because we don't really uh, have that platform or maybe don't have that documentary that just dropped that is talking about. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Those issues, um, so we're never able to really tell our side of the story. Yeah. Um, so this one slide, a pretty big one that we deal with um, in California, particularly. Mm. Yeah. No, I think it's definitely an important conversation to have, especially with the Endangered Species Act, like you mentioned, uh, and you know, like you said, there, you know, we don't have a whole lot covering the ag side of things either. So like n- probably the number one uh, question I get from, from consumers I bring on the show is all about documentaries. You know, this documentary said this, this documentary said that, you know, so, you know, ag is kind of at a, at a disadvantage in that state because just, just, we don't have anything out there defending us in, in that way. So people to only get one half of the conversation and that kind of skews their understanding of what's actually going on. And that tends to hurt, you know, the farmer at the end of the day. And so I think it's important to kind of have the conversations of getting the information out there. Even if, you know, even if the ultimate decision is, yes, we still need to protect these species. Okay, well, as long as both sides are being addressed equally, then then that's a fair assessment. But we're not even getting our say in the matter kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. So now I think it's a, as good a time as any to kind of transition into uh, what you were hoping to talk about today. Uh, so you said you have some, some updates on the COVID situation um, in the United States in, in terms of agriculture. So uh, what do you got for us? Oh, boy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if there was one industry that I think was hit really hard by this um, pandemic, it was uh, the ag industry. Mm-hmm. Overnight, um, farmers who depend on maybe 90% of their sales um, uh, through a contract for um, food service or food retail um, had canceled contracts. What do you do with all of that produce? Um, What do you do with the commodity you're producing for that contract? Um, We are just all over the place. Um, COVID taught us a lot of things. Um, COVID taught us that our food supply chain isn't as strong as we thought. There are um, a lot of issues we need to deal with, ranging from transportation to the fuel. Um, and uh, the food banks is actually a prime example, you know, to the point that what do our growers do with that produce? I was getting about 15 to 20 calls a day. What do I do with um, my table break that I just harvested? What do I do with my almonds that were supposed to go to this restaurant and are not for my tomatoes? whatever the commodity was so we immediately pivoted to feeding people because that is our producer's number one priority Mm -hmm. um and that meant getting to the food bank um you know it's so devastating how so many people are unemployed laid off and they don't have a means or income to be able to feed themselves or their family so our producers were able to send a lot of that product to the food banks but that is where we learned a lot as well. And mm. it's not on the food banks and it's not on the producers, it's just the food supply chain in general. 
the food banks don't have the infrastructure in place to be able to store that food, Mm -hmm. um, to be able to store, you know, more perishable good in a cold storage facility that they don't have the income or means to have on site. So you heard about these stories where there was product being dumped and our our growers weren't doing it intentionally. And I, I don't really know any growers specifically who did that because they found a way, you know, to donate that food to a food bank or to a local nonprofit. But there are stories that were out there indicating that was going on or that they were, you know, um, digging their produce underground because Mm -hmm. they didn't know what to do with it. Um, There was one in particular in Florida I heard um, just thousands and thousands of pounds of squash, yellow squash, because they didn't have anywhere to send it. Um, So I would say that was probably the most rattling experience at the start. Um, We started better understanding what we could do, you know, um, who we could work with, uh, big distributors. Um, We started talking about the stimulus packages that I'm sure you've heard of Mm -hmm. um, that were taken up and voted on at the federal level and then signed into law by President Trump. And some of those included some assistance for producers. I'll talk about two programs in particular and kind of kick up top level so we don't get too technical. But um, one was uh, really helped with the food supply chain. It's called the Family Food Box Program. Mm. And it was it's a program that was administered out of the Department of Agriculture. And um, the intention of it was to get this produce um, due to the lost scale contracts that um, our producers are um, don't know what to do with. To get it into these boxes um, that were then going to be um, pulled together and um, uh, given out at these nonprofits or these food banks to those most in need within our communities. And it's been successful. I think it's, there's over 30 million boxes that have been pulled together and sent out. Um, so there were contracts that were awarded in different regions, um, many here in California. And it gave um, one food to those most in need, but to the agriculture community and to our growers here in California, it gave them an opportunity to place their commodity in that box. Um, So that was of great assistance. And then the second program was a direct payment program. So um, it gave uh, our producers an opportunity to submit um, an application to the Department of Agriculture and receive a payment for some of their losses in sales due to COVID. Mm. So that was very helpful just to keep them afloat, continue, continuing to produce in California and not have to shut down their business or doors. Um, so that was helpful. Unfortunately, Congress is kind of in a uh, uh, partisan bickering <laughs> uh, situation right now. They've been going a little back and forth on what this next stimulus looks like. And I know for consumers who are listening to this, um, when they think stimulus, they think of that stimulus check. They think of the unemployment. And all of that would be included. Uh, but, you know, in particular for our producers, we're looking for more assistance um, as much as possible, which uh, brings me to a good point. The, the second one I want to bring up, and, and that's the need to continue to um, to be able to ensure our, our uh, workforce's safety. Mm-hmm. Um, you hear about a lot of news out there um, related to spikes in rural uh, parts of the United States. Um, and the fact that growers aren't doing enough to safeguard their employees. I can promise you that our growers in California, I can't speak for the rest of the nation, but here in California are doing everything in their power. They've spent millions and millions of dollars out of their pocket for these protective personal equipment resources. And it is very unfortunate that although they were deemed essential, agriculture and the food supply chain, in case folks didn't know, back in March, were deemed an essential business and industry. That means they were still required to do what they were doing, and they were still required to go to work. Mm-hmm. Although they were deemed essential, they received no assistance from the federal government, like other industries did, that were also essential. Mm. So that means that, again, that, that sort of equipment has to come out of the growers' pocket. Um, that includes anything from N95 masks to, um, to plexiglass, glass, whatever you have to do in your facility according to CDC guidelines to ensure your um, farm employee safety. Uh, so that is one area that we continue to need assistance on, that we continue to really focus on. It's our number one priority in this next 
stimulus uh, round of negotiations whenever that happens, and that is that funding and resources are allocated to the agriculture community for PPE resources and to continue to safeguard their employees by receiving those resources because we've been doing a stellar job at it, and that's not covered by media. Um, but we also need assistance to continue doing that stellar job. Hmm. So two biggest issues, I would say, from um, this pandemic that our growers have had to face, and it, it's been um, that, just continuing to operate in a safe environment and what that means and looks like. And then it's also just been the disruption to the food supply chain. Hmm. Yeah, no, I definitely would would agree. Those are two major uh, major takeaways from from everything that's been going on lately. And I'm really glad you brought it up because I have received questions and I've seen people on Facebook talking about it. And I've I've heard people talk about it in, in you know in the grocery stores or whatever that you know they see the price of their milk and their pork and their beef go up or or that the the quantity of those products isn't available at all. And they hear about these farmers that are having to scrap product while they. You know, they don't understand why both of those things could be happening at the same time. Like, you know, if if there's not enough beef, then why are they why are they getting rid of their their animals? And, and you know, if there's not enough milk, then why are they pouring milk out and all this kind of stuff? And they don't realize that you know the processor is the one that's getting shut down, or that mm-hmm. the distributors are getting backed up, or that you know there there are other outlets that are getting shut down in the process, and that's hurting that that farmer's ability to get that product to the to the retailer. And so, you know, and, and like you mentioned with, with the uh, with the food banks, which I'm really glad you brought up because I've, I've been asked that question on multiple occasions and I didn't really have a clear answer for them. I basically just said, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of steps in the process that are that are kind of under under attack right now just from everything going on that it's, it's difficult to get the product where it needs to go. But I didn't even think about the fact that the food banks don't even have the facilities to store all that food, let alone distribute it to all the people that it needs to get to. And so, you know, it's... Um, I'm I'm very glad that you brought up the you know all all the different parts of of the machine that are not working properly right now, and it's not that they're not working because of you know the, like you said it's not the producer's fault it's not the consumer's fault it's just that there's so many different things going wrong right now that people are trying to adapt to and like you know the processors were shut down for so long and we were still trying to figure out what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do because like you said ag was considered essential but they weren't getting any help so it was coming out of the producer's pocket and there's just you know there's so many different red flags going up that, that nobody really knew how to how to handle i you know i think that by now a lot of the producers have adapted ways of of fixing their operations and maybe they're not perfect but they've they've found ways to kind of adapt to everything going on but it's still you know there's still obstacles that need to be overcome in terms of of regulation and actual production methods that are being completely halted because of just different parts of the chain being broken Exactly, exactly. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I would say it was probably two weeks since the shelter in place order, at least in California. Mm. And I went to a grocery store to go buy uh, some proteins and quote unquote essentials, you know, some eggs, Mm -hmm. and nothing was there. I think I ended up buying some um, frozen fish sticks (laughs) um, (laughs) that was going to serve as my protein. No offense to those individuals who like fish sticks. I, I might not be the biggest fan. Um, and that right there was just so telling mm-hmm. of the food supply chain and the areas that we really improve upon is the fact that, you know, we didn't have the transportation coming in as quickly as we needed to. The mm-hmm. demand was so much higher. People were hoarding stuff. I mean, I think my aunt bought like 40 bags of flour and I couldn't believe it when she was telling me this stuff, but you know, it was just, it was our knee-jerk reaction. We didn't know what this said. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's a huge learning for, for everyone, but it, it sometimes you have to find a silver lining. Mm-hmm. And I would say that in this pandemic, it's that we as a food supply chain, now we work even close, more closely with the um, restaurant industry. Mm-hmm. We work more closely now with food distributors, with transportation hubs, with food banks, and it took something like this for us to do that mm-hmm. because forever we thought it's just it's so fine. You know, not too many hiccups, but the pandemic really showed us where the discrepancies are and what we need to work on. 
Yeah, definitely. And that was actually another question I was going to ask you, or do you think there's any um, advantages, you know, anything, anything positive that came out of this, this whole uh, pandemic, but I think that you answered that you know pretty pretty clearly. There's been a lot of improved relationships on on both the consumer end and on the producer end, and and all the all the steps in between as well. You know, there's like you said, there's been a lot of of you know mutual understanding with the uh, the retailers and and the producers having to learn how to how to get along better. And there's been actually a lot of consumers that have come to me that are wanting to learn more about where their food comes from. So I think overall the the literacy aspect of agriculture and and the like the communication between the different steps of the chain has definitely improved and i think that you you know you hit the nail around right the head by by saying that that you know that's kind of the the silver lining of this whole deal is that you know we're getting better at having those conversations and having an understanding of how much goes into each step of that process for it to work properly yeah yeah absolutely and one more thing that i think a lot of your um, viewers consumers would appreciate is the fact that um, when the pandemic first started, uh, we kind of shifted away from a lot of imports. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the um, ports of entry were shut down. Um, so a lot of the produce that you probably buy, your Trader Joe's, your Safeway, um, would sometimes to be like 50-50 in terms of stuff coming in from other countries and stuff produced here in the States, um, shifted to like uh, 80% being produced here. So you were consuming stuff that was uh, American goods. Uh, American produced uh, ag products, and I think that's pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> we don't need to get into the technical details regarding uh, trade policy and why it is the way it is, but um, that was pretty unique. Um, and I think even more so now, although it's been a couple months and things have um, normalized a little bit on the trade front, mm-hmm. you could still go to your stores and see um, a lot more domestic produce um, instead of what it used to be. Uh, before the pandemic mm-hmm. yeah no definitely there's definitely been a lot of changes and adaptations to the way that we handle a lot of the a lot of the old ways that we were doing things in terms of trade just our, our overall foreign relations and and all of our communication and all that kind of stuff it's definitely putting a new spin on on how we ran our food production and and, and you know getting food to the consumer all of that has completely you know, been flipped on its head now. And it's kind of, it's interesting to see how it's all changing. But, you know, you know, like you, like you mentioned, it was kind of hit or miss for a long time. We weren't really sure what was going to happen. But it's, it's you know, I, I think that we're starting to get to a point where things are starting to stabilize. But we're still learning every day things that we can do better to to improve the situation of, of how we get food to, to its final product. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm. I, I think we're in that um a good place compared to a couple of months back. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's thanks to some of those programs I flagged and then just, you know, also just kind of trying to adapt and learn what this new um, era, I don't even know what to call it, <laughs> looks like. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I'm sure things will get interesting again. Who knows? Um, but at least we've learned some lessons the last few months to be prepared for whatever is next. <laughs> Yeah, no, I definitely think we we have, you know, we still have a ways to go before everything kind of kind of clears and and I'm not entirely sure we're ever going to be back to how we were before, but I'm glad that we are starting to get to a point with, you know, with the help of like you said those programs that were involved as well as our, you know, our our rural ingenuity of of adaptation just to kind of get us, you know, get us over that that hump, but no, I'm 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 fairly hopeful personally that we're going to get back to either back to how things were or we're going to be in a better place than we were when we started. Let's sure hope so, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm we can do. Optimistic. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's all we can do right now is hope. But yeah, so yeah. I, th- I think, I mean, unless you had anything else on, on the COVID situation, I think that that kind of wraps up that point pretty well. Uh-huh. Um, I think that's, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So I had a couple more questions for you before we uh, wrap up here. Um, so okay. you went through, like you mentioned, you went through a, a, you know, a couple different educational programs leading into your career in, in you know, in uh, policy and, and law and legislature and all those all those fields. How have you seen, particularly that with agriculture, but how have you seen the the landscape of of that field evolve since you've uh, you know since you since you've gotten out of the educational system? And also for anyone who wants to go into that education system, what what advice would you give them? Wow. Um, <laughs> by that, I'm sorry, you mean um, 
when I went to university. Yeah. And just the degree. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's, everything's different now, obviously, you know, mm. the pandemic and, and going virtual. So um, if you're an extrovert, I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> hopefully you have some social distancing going on on campuses. Um, I, I would say that, you know, in particular, when we talk um, about the degree, I, I got um, politics and political studies has changed drastically. Um, just, you know, looking at the federal level and kind of um, where the two parties have shifted. Mm-hmm. Let's get to political. Um, <laughs> but it seems like, uh, you know, the left side has, has gone to the far left and the right has gone to the far right. Mm-hmm. So. I think that when I was studying it, when I was trying to understand, you know, the federal government, um, state, local government, and just kind of um, the political parties and, um, you know, conservative policies versus progressive, um, that's probably shifted a lot. Um, I think, you know, there's there used to be this sense of bipartisan nature in D.C. in particular. I can't really speak to California because I think it's always been a little slanted. <laughs> um, but... You don't see that going on anymore. Um, and I think when these professors are teaching um, folks in these programs about, um, you know, you want to be a public servant or you want to go um, serve in an administration, what does that look like? Um, and and uh, what kind of just the political field looks like now? And that's definitely changed since, since I was in school, um, which is, gosh, so long ago now. Um so I, I think that's definitely um, a, an aspect of a, a, at least a bachelor's in political science or politics um, that has probably shifted a lot. You know, other than that, I, I would just say that I think folks are more engaged now, students mm-hmm. on campus, and I think in political ways. And mm-hmm. I think that's awesome. Um, I think... You know, not to, to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, because I'm sure you get this from every angle, but it's so important to vote now. Mm-hmm. When we first started this conversation today, we talked about having a seat at the table, and that is one, one way to do it, to exercise your right. And I remind the Act community and the members of the Farm Bureau and just our farmers in general how important that is. It doesn't matter who you vote for, but, you know, get out there. Don't complain about the issues you're dealing with unless you are voting. <laughs> Because otherwise, you, you really don't have a, a, a leg to stand on. Mm-hmm. You can just, you know, complain about all the issues you're dealing with. And anyways, we, we don't, I'm not going to go on a tangent about that. <laughs> but I think that now um, students who are in college are way more invested in that and interested. Um, and I know it's limited right now because of involvement in clubs or societies on campus due to COVID are probably all virtual or just haven't happened this semester or year. But um, I think that that's impressive. I think it's important, and I think that's something that I definitely lacked. Um, and there wasn't a lot of conversation about it, or it was very limited when I was um, doing my studies at the university. Hmm. Awesome. Well, yeah, I definitely agree with all the points that you uh, you brought up in terms of you know being more involved and having your feet at the table and and all that kind of stuff. And that actually kind of ties into the last question I had for you. So, with that note of you know it's it's important to be informed and and to have your you know to to have your say in in the matter agriculture has kind of had a hard time with that over the past few years you know we're we're kind of new to the media game we're kind of making our you know we're making our mark for the first time and it's it's kind of rough because like you said people have already been there telling our story for us and they've been telling the wrong story this whole time and so in order for that story to be fixed in order for us to to bring our story to the table and to, and to tell it properly, agriculture needs to take some new steps into educating the public. So in terms of, you know, with, with legislature, with just informing people about what's going on in the industry, um, in, in terms of having the conversations about, you know, how to have better communication between the industries in agriculture and then without, you know, with agriculture, with the consumer, um, you know, what, what, what advice would you give in terms of how, to, how we can better educate the, the consumer about what's going on in the agricultural world? Sure. I could sum it up in one sentence. I always remind people in our industry and that's let's stop play. Let's stop playing defense and let's start playing offense hmm. because what we do as an industry is we react negative pieces that are dropped 
to negative documentaries, or I'm sorry, from our perspective, negative documentaries that only tell one side of the story. Mm -hmm. And we are not actively, proactively out there um, doing op-eds, talking about all the great things that we're doing in agriculture. Um, And if we are, it's very limited. And I think uh, as an industry, we're doing a little bit of a better job at that because Mm -hmm. folks have come to a realization that it's very important that, one, we stop turning our back on those who have um, differing opinions and instead we um, reach out to them and we have a conversation and um, we try to find some middle ground Um, and then we also you know talk about focus groups trying to understand what consumers want what their their biggest um, issues are or their idea of agriculture and how we can shift and work with them to educate them on, um, you know, what we're actually doing pertaining to that issue in particular that they might have, um, you know, an interest in. Um, but I think, you know, the moral of the story, and, and it's, it's the one that I tell and have been telling since I've been working in this space, that we have never been out there so actively trying to get our message out. And mm-hmm. if we do it, it's like once in a while with a rowdy, you know, a held at the Capitol, or it's a fly in. Um, you know, pre COVID, a big part of my job was bringing a lot of our producers to Washington, D.C. to meet with members of Congress and to quote unquote tell their story. And a lot of those members of Congress are those ones who are in urban settings, don't know a lot about agriculture, or if they do, it's, you know, based on a documentary or just kind of one side of the story that they've heard. And they appreciated it so much. Um, and, and that's definitely one way we've always been proactive, but that's more on the advocacy space. I think in general, our industry really needs to get out there and find opportunities and ways to get in front of consumers, to get, you know, in front of those groups that they may not agree with and start having those conversations. And that is the only way we'll be successful. (laughs) Yeah, no, I definitely couldn't agree more. And that's kind of the, you know, the reason I asked that question and I ask it of, of almost every guest that I have on here from the agricultural industry is because, you know, like you like you said, agriculture for a long time wasn't doing a super great job of 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 doing you know that same thing, and and we're starting to kind of get there now. But everyone's got a different perspective on how to handle it. And if we're going to, you know, this this podcast is all about educating consumers about agriculture. If we're going to do that properly, it's important that we all have you know a, a good understanding of how that can be done. You know, and the way I've been doing it with the podcast is bringing consumers on here because over time I learned that if I don't go to them, they're not going to come to me because consumers don't look for agricultural stuff. It's not part of the mainstream, um, you know, media. So it's not, it's not even in their attention span. Like they're not even like, they're not going to actively think about it. And so they're not going to look for it. And so you have to bring it to them. Isn't that so funny though? It is. It's just because everyone's become such quote unquote foodies and invested <laughs> in this farm to fork movement mm-hmm. and I'm saying, Oh my gosh, well this all stems from agriculture. Mm-hmm. So there was that much interest, you know, in the food blocks and the influencers who are have these awesome accounts but don't know where that stuff is coming from. I just you know, again, it's about being out there. Yeah. Representing agriculture and not restaurant space, which is a part of the conversation. But mm-hmm you know, representing what's happening at the ground level and getting folks that interested in it as they are in the Fuji and farm to pork movement. Yeah, no, and what I've noticed is like I've actually been trying to get a hold of some 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 of those foodies to have them on to talk about that kind of stuff. But um what I've noticed is that they're like almost there. Like, you know, they, they have an interest in, in the food and the restaurant and the farm to fork process and all that kind of stuff. As soon as you introduce to them just a like a sliver more of what's going on behind the scenes, then you've got them. I mean, like they're so close to having an interest in agriculture. It's like they're just barely missing the mark until you introduce it to them. And so yeah. that's been kind of my, my method of, of, you know, handling the podcast is bringing consumers on. Cause obviously like, like I mentioned, you have to bring it to them. And so I bring them on the podcast, have the conversation and I try to relate it to things that they understand. You know, I bring agriculture in, in terms of movies, video games, books, you know, TV shows, anywhere where agriculture can be related. You know, even if it's not a direct, like, you know, this person's a farmer, but there's, there's correlations to things that we can use in agriculture. Like I, I had an episode where we talked about star Wars and how star Wars droids are like farming robots and you know like it's like just random stuff like that it it's interesting to them you know they 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 find it interesting because that's what they know as that's home for them but it's still tying it back to agriculture and so you know 
not not saying that that's what everyone needs to do whenever they're trying to talk to consumers about agriculture, but it, it seems to be a method that's working for, for me at least. And if we can find more things like that that work, we should be using them to try to get to the consumer. Exactly. I could not agree more. And I think your podcast is, I mean, just awesome because it's <laughs> doing that. And, and that's why I reached out. And, and um, I don't know if I was supposed to tell, tell everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> That is why I thought, hey, you know, here's another opportunity to um, to not constantly play defense and play offense mm-hmm. and um, just get on this podcast and, and tell our story, yeah. um, especially as it pertains to policy, because that's really what is keeping us from continuing to produce mm-hmm. um, or keeping us in continuing to produce. Either way, it, it depends on, you know, the policy or regulation, but mm-hmm. it's important, so... Um, I appreciate this opportunity, really, really do. Yeah, definitely. Well, I definitely appreciate you reaching out and wanting to come on. I mean, I hadn't had that many people actually reach out to me and want to be on an episode, so it's always really exciting when somebody does. And yeah, I think it was a great conversation. It's, like I mentioned to you before we even recorded, it's, it's a conversation I haven't had on the podcast before, but I've really wanted to. I've just been looking for the right person that actually knows what they're talking about, because like I say on my podcast all the time, I do a lot of research, but I'm not an expert in any of these fields. So if I have someone on who is, then they're worth trusting more than I am because I just do, you know, I read a couple articles. I don't spend years studying it in college. So anyone, anytime I can bring someone on that can shed more light on a topic that I've tried talking about before, I'm going to do it. And so it's, you know, the fact that you brought, that you brought up the subject to me of, of talking about regulations and COVID and all that kind of stuff, I was, you know, immediately fired up about it. I wanted to have you on here to talk about it because it's an important topic to talk about. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, if you ever want to do uh, issue-focused podcast, you know, on any of the, um, I, the issues that I brought up earlier, please let me mm-hmm. know. Always, always happy to educate. Um, the general public, consumers, your viewers, uh, or folks who are tuning in mm-hmm. on um, any of the major issues that are impacting our farmers. Um, yeah. So please just keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah, definitely. I I will 100% take you up on that in the future. I'll look. I'll listen back to that and kind of take notes of all of the issues we talked about and say, hey, you know, I don't have an episode on this. This might be good for people to talk about. Or if I, you know, because like I said, I get questions all the time from consumers e- either on my show or off my show, and I I kind of point them in the right direction or I give them, you know, what I've found through my research, but. I'm, you know, like I said, there's, there's only so much that I can provide that a professional could provide more. So I'd, you know, if, if, if I get asked a question, I might say, Hey, you know, could we do an episode on this? Like I, I get asked this question a lot or something like that. So yeah, that'd be awesome. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anytime. <laughs> I, I live for the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I definitely appreciate you, uh, you reaching out. Um, before we close out, do you have anything else you want to, uh, you want to share with our audience? Do you have any, any links you want to share, any pages you want, you want tagged, any, you know, social media, anything like that? Um, yes, actually I do. Okay. Uh, check out the hashtag on, uh, Twitter and on Instagram and Facebook, uh, hashtag still farming. And I think you're going to see some resilient leaders on there posting about what all they're dealing with right now related to the pandemic and not at the ground level um, with some pretty devastating photos that a lot of producers throughout the United States have posted on that hashtag handle. Mm. Um, I would just, um, you know, take the opportunity to look into that. Um, I know that there's been thousands and thousands of posts um, since the pandemic started, but like I said, um, the still farming hashtag applies to issues we have dealt with way before the pandemic as well. So I'd encourage folks to check that out. Mm. Yeah, I'll definitely be shouting that out and I'll, I'll, I'll even tag it myself that people have an, have an easy access to it. Um, yeah, that's awesome. You know, it's anytime I get to, anytime I get to support other farmers on social media, I, I like to do it. It's always good to get the word out there. Absolutely. And if folks are interested in following my Instagram account too, I'm happy to talk Yeah, no, I'm if you also if, trying to educate folks on issues. Yeah. Um, policy issues pertaining to agriculture a lot more too through my post. So that's uh S L U D U. Um and and that's it. I, I can pronounce it but many of my friends make fun of me because they pronounce it in many different ways. So <laughs> let's just keep it at S L G U G U. <laughs> okay I'll, I'll definitely tag it down in the description too and whenever i share it i'll i'll tag you in it that way people can find you easier 
Okay. Great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, before, you know, you know, I think that that's, that's all the questions I had for you. So I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to close with, but, um, yeah, I'd just like to thank you a lot for coming on to the episode. I think it was a lot of fun. It was a really good conversation. I think people are really going to enjoy this one. I can't wait. Uh, and I appreciate your time and, and letting me be on to tell our story. Yeah, of course. So yeah, thanks again for coming on. Thank you to all my listeners for tuning in. And don't forget, if you ate today, thank a farmer.